sacrificed lamb has been slain, his blood on the altar stained to wipe away guilt and pain. Bring hope eternal, so final And if you believe in your heart, Yeshua, you'll know. behind them that your will will be done through every word every yacht every tittle you had it all planned out from the beginning of time and even before that and we just ask that you guide these words let them soak into our hearts cut out what needs to be cut out sow what needs to be sown and reap what needs to be re reaped and we pray these things in Yeshua's mighty name amen amen all right so a little bit of um, background on Shavuot so we know that um, it's the sixth day of the month of Sivan. It's a one-day feast, and it's, uh, they actually celebrate it um, for, for two days. And so they know that it's, uh, it's the giving of the law. In rabbinic tradition, uh, they went up to Mount Sinai, and that's when they received the law. Um, but traditionally, it's the giving of first fruits for, for the wheat harvest, for the wheat harvest. Um, so there's eight names 
Um, and they're, they're quite extensive. I'll do my best with the, with the Hebrew here. There's Hog Hav Shuot, which is the Feast of Weeks, and we see that in Exodus 34:22, as well as Deuteronomy 16:10. We have Hog Hakadzir, which is the Feast of the Harvest, which is in Exodus 23:16, and then Yom Bikarim, which is the Day of the First Fruits, which is Numbers 28:26. Then we have Hag Atzeret, which is the closing feast. This is a rabbinical term. Atzeret Shel Pesach, which is the closing season of the Passover, which is another rabbinic term. Zaman Matan Torah Tenu, time of giving of the law of Moses, which is also a rabbinic term. And then Ten Hemeron Tes Pentecostes, which is a Greek name which is the day of Pentecost in Acts 2-1, 2016, as well as 1 Corinthians 16, 8. So it is a harvest festival that begun back in 15 BC to AD 70. Of course, they couldn't do it after that because the temple was destroyed and it was like a parade. So here you bring your first fruits. There's a big festival, they're marching down to the temple, there's instruments being played, played, and so that's the giving of your first fruits from the wheat harvest. Um, there's some rabbinic, switch, switch, thank you. There's some foods that are um, eaten during this time. There's cheese blintzes, two loaves of challah, and kreplach are also eaten this time. I apologize in advance for not having that for you, but hopefully we'll have that for next week so you could taste some of that. Hint, hint, anybody led to bring some Kreplock or some Blintzes next week, that would be absolutely awesome. They're delicious. They're delicious. Um, so during this time, um, there's uh, two loaves of bread that are waved, and so there's, um, these are actually leavened bread, where in Passover it was unleavened bread, and so they had to wave one of them before the lamb was slaughtered, and then after it, they had to wave it after the lamb was slaughtered. One of them went to the priest, and then one of them went to the high priest, which it had to be consumed prior to, to midnight. Um, there's a, lots of scriptures that are read during this time. Um, there's Exodus 19, 1 through 20. Um, there's scripture through the book of Numbers. There's also scripture through Deuteronomy, Ezekiel, Habakkuk. They read the entire book of Ruth, um, which talks about a conversion of Ruth to Judaism. Um, so being some proselyte there. Um, also, David was said to be, have died on this date. And then, of course, the giving of the law according to rabbinic tradition. Um, there's some also liturgical services that go on to this. Jerry probably has some memories of, of those during, during his younger days. Um, not saying that you're old or anything, Jerry. Just Okay. <laughs> um, they read Psalm 113 through 118. Um, there was an Aramaic hymn that was recited, Octomote, and then Tikkun Le Shaviot, which is the preparing of the night of Shavuot, which is an anthology of the indivisibility of both the written and the oral law. Um, in the New Testament, in the Brit Hadashah, of course, we know in Acts 2, 1 through 4, that's when the first monk messianic congregations were born during this time. And then in 1 Corinthians, uh, we know that Paul went to Ephesus during this time. So there's some serious messianic implications here. One would be the giving of the Holy Spirit, and that's kind of what's going to be our message today, is about this key thing that happens in our lives and in the lives of the world, as well as the prophetic timeline, is the giving of, of the Holy Spirit. And so, um, during this time, we can see that in 1 Corinthians, it says, for by one Spirit, the Holy Spirit, right? We are all baptized into one body, whether we're Jews or we're Goy or Greek or the nations. Doesn't matter. Okay, we were once slaves and now we are free by the Holy Spirit and the acceptance of Yeshua. Also in Col Colossians, um, we have He is head of the body, 
the church who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in these things he may have preeminence. Okay, that does not mean he was created. That means he is preeminence over all of that. He is in charge. Okay, don't get caught up in them cultic versions where it's saying that he was created. That's not what Paul was talking about. He was fighting Gnosticism in the book of Colossians. And so that brings us um, to what do these loaves represent? One loaf, they say, represents the Jews, and the other represents the nations or the Gentiles. And so we see that um, these spring feasts are already fulfilled. So we've had the Passover, we had Shavuot, and then that is the spring feasts have already been fulfilled. And so now there's a pause. There's a pause all the way to the fall feasts, which we are waiting for the return of the Messiah. The spring feasts were the first coming. The fall feasts are the second coming. So these are all prophetic feasts that were written long ago that now looking through the eyes of Messiah through the revelation of the Holy Spirit, we can see that these things have already been fulfilled. And so praise the Lord, we're ready to see the second coming and we see in these times are already coming near with the rebirth of Israel as, as a nation, as prophesied. So we're right there, we're right there for, for the second coming of the Lord. I'm ready. I don't know about you, but praise the Lord, Maranatha, let's, let's get this on. <laughs> let's get, right? All right. So that's kind of our synopsis of the Feast of Shavuot. And I wanted to talk about kind of, there's something that's very perplexing to me when I started with the, the book of James. Yaakov, I mean, his, he wasn't named James, he was Yaakov, right? Um, so we anglicized it. And so Yaakov was, was Jesus' Yeshua's brother. And here's what's interesting is um, if we look at John 7, verses 2 through 5, we see that, um, that he's not a believer. And so when we turn to John 7, 2 through 5, it says, uh, now the Jews in the Feast of Tabernacles was at hand. His brothers therefore said to him, depart from here and go to Judea, that your disciples also may see the works that you are doing, for no one does anything in secret while he himself seeks to be known openly. If you do these things, show yourself in the world, for even his brothers did not believe him. And I'm like going, how, how can that happen? I mean, here, I mean, Mary was very, very well aware that he was the Messiah. And, you, and you're growing up with Yeshua in your household. I mean, they didn't have these mansions and these large houses like we have today. They probably were all in the same room. And he didn't believe that his brother was the Messiah at this time. I don't know, this kind of struck me weird. What, 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 what's going on with that? Maybe he thought that, you know what, he's just, you know, yeah, I get all these stories about this and, and that, and, but he's really weird. He's, he's kind of strange, right? You know, we're heading down to Jerusalem, and then he gets lost, and we find him in the temple, and he's talking to the rabbis at their level. And he's just kind of a weird dude, right? He, he didn't believe it. And then we find in the book of Mark, Yeshua is in the temple, or not in the temple, he's in a house and he's preaching to a whole bunch of people and it's so packed that his brothers and his mother can't get in. And he says, well, they're not my brothers. You all are. So we can see there that, that they didn't believe, believe as well. And we know from kind of the tradition that they thought that Yeshua was going to come back and kick some butt and bring in the messianic kingdom. And so they went to synagogue every day. I mean, it's not like they had, um, you know, movie theaters and all these things and, you know, sports teams to go to and softball and volleyball and soccer. It's like, okay, they went to synagogue on, on Saturday, on Shabbat. 
So we know they heard everything. They knew the prophecies, but for some reason, they forgot the first part. Thought that he was going to come back and kick some butt and then bring in the messianic kingdom. First he came as a suffering service. This, this, was, this was overlooked. Not, that wasn't isolated to James. All the disciples, when, when they're there, you know, at the Last Supper, they're talking to Jesus saying, who's going to be first? So they're, at this time, they're thinking, hey, I want to be, you know, I want to be your right-hand man, Yeshua. Come on, buddy, 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 buddy. Right? Let alone Yeshua kind of gradually brought him in, says, Peter, do you love me? Do you love me? Peter, you're going to be crucified, buddy. Okay, you're going to die for my cause. You're going to die for this, right? So he's bringing the disciples and he's bringing James to this point of where something came into his life, despite all those years growing up, something had to come into his life and change him forever. Change him forever. So let's go over to Acts 15, verses 13, and then I'll skip over to verse 19. So I want you to get a picture of where James is after the fact. After the fact. So James started his life as the brother of Yeshua, not as a believer, but towards the end of his life, this is what they looked at him as. It says, and they had became saying they're at the they're at the Jerusalem council, right? So there's stuff going on. The 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 Gentiles are starting to come into the faith and they have some questions. And so they're all talking and so James answers saying, "Men and brethren, listen to me. Therefore I judge that we should not trouble those among the Gentiles who are turning to God, who are turning to God." He has command of the Jerusalem council. He's like up there, they're looking. He silenced all the apostles and saying, "Look, this is what the Gentiles are turning to God. Why? Why are they turning to God? What changed James, and what elevated him to this position as the head of the the congregation in Jerusalem?" And we find that out if we go to John chapter 20 verse 22 so this is after Yeshua was crucified and he's spending time with the apostles and he gives them something special that changes changes their lives it says and when he had said this he breathed his ruach his breath his breath on them and said receive the Holy Spirit. Receive the Holy Spirit. Something breathed by the Messiah went out and changed the apostles, changed the life and the perspective of his brother Yaakov so that now he says, boom, I got it. I know what this is all about. All that stuff I learned prior to that, okay, now it all makes sense. It, I can relate to it now. And then he becomes the head of the Jerusalem Council. He's head of the church in Jerusalem at that time and was later martyred, right? They believe that he was thrown off the temple because he was out there preaching the good news of the gospel. Yeshua gives us a pattern. We receive the Holy Spirit as this congregation here. Everybody's here because they have received the Holy Spirit. Praise the Lord for that. If you haven't, come and see me and we'll, we'll talk to you about it. You receive the Holy Spirit and something has changed in your life, but this is a pattern of growth that was given by our Messiah in Acts 1, verse 8. And it says, but you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you and you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem, all of Judea, Samaria, and then to the end of the earth. There's our pattern from the time of the recipients of the Holy Spirit until our Messiah comes back in the second coming. And so we know that during the Jerusalem Council, 
Okay, the word was starting to get to the Gentiles as promised by the Messiah. He said when the Holy Spirit goes out, this is what it's going to do. It's going to start here, then it's going to go to Judea and Samaria, and then it's going to go out to the entire world. The entire world, it's going to happen. So we see in Acts 9, verse 31, that it's coming to fruition. It says, Then the churches throughout all Judea and Galilee and Samaria had peace and were edified, walking in the fear of the Lord and comfort of the Holy Spirit. And what happens when you do that? You were multiplied. There's another nugget there. When you have the Holy Spirit and you're walking in the fear of the Lord, okay, you're going to multiply. The congregations are going to grow throughout all the world when you follow the Messiah, you fear the Lord, and you have the Holy Spirit. Without those two things, it's not going to happen. It's not going to happen at all. And so there's a hiccup that happens because now they're bringing in the Gentiles. The pagans are coming in. The dirty people. Okay, they're pretty rank, right? This is the whole reason why we had to pull Abraham out of a pagan nation so he can start weaving all of this together and so he can straighten all this mess up. So now he's straightening it up. He's given us the power of the Holy Spirit. Now he's going back to this pagan nation and he's going to work it all out. Well, what do we do with them? These pagans and all their rituals and they're just a hot mess. What do we do with them? And so at the Jerusalem Council, they worked all that out. They received the Holy Spirit. They're walking in the fear of the Lord. They're going to multiply, according to Yeshua. And so they did. And so they did. If we turn to Romans 15, 21, we can see that this is not something that was just pulled out of their hat. Because Yeshua, not only did he say it, but also Rabbi Shaul, quoting Isaiah, it says, but as it is written, to whom he was not announced, he wasn't announced to the pagans, to the Gentiles, they will see. And those who have not heard, they will understand. We understand because we receive the Holy Spirit. All these things have become clear to us. You could be talking all day long to someone about the Messiah and how these feasts work, and it's just like a deer in the head, like, look, right? Why? It's because they haven't received the Holy Spirit. Okay, when you, get, when you get it, when you get it, all that stuff is wiped away and their eyes, their eyes are open. Now, now they can see because the power of the Holy Spirit. And it continues to grow. The churches continue to expand. The Gentiles are coming in. And so by the time John writes the book of Revelation, they say there's over 100 churches in Asia Minor. So unless, what, Jesus is in the 30s. So in 70 years, okay, we're looking at over 100 Messianic congregations with Jews and Gentiles in there together in some form or fashion during the book of Revelation around 100 CE. Huge growth. Huge growth that is happening as promised, as promised by the Messiah. Now, we know that this time was not just all lovey-dovey and kisses and hugs and stuff like that. I mean, there was people that were martyred. We know that Stephen, um, in 35 CE, um, he got stoned to death because he was preaching the gospel. We also, James, the son of Zebedee, he was also persecuted under Herod Agrippa. Then we know that from the time of Nero and onwards, the Romans say, hey, this isn't just some little fad that's going on that we can control in an isolated situation. 
Right? Remember Roman peace? Okay, we're going to come and pounce you with the legion of Roman soldiers, right? We're going to squash you. Okay, we're going to squash the messianic believers. Okay, we're going to put you up on a stick and make you a nightstand. Right? We're going to light the streets with you. That's Nero. Okay, then it expands out. Okay, it expands out, and then it becomes all throughout the Roman Empire, there's the leaders are going to squash this, this belief in the Messiah. Okay, we got to squash it. It's getting too big. Okay, it can't go on. We know that the devil's behind that. The devil does not want the Christian faith to grow. He does not want the messianic believers passing on. Because that's a timeline for him when he's going to be out of here permanently. So he's going to do everything that he can to stop this growth. We are going to persecute the messianic believers. We're going to persecute any pagan that starts converting to Christianity. We're going to kill them. We're going to squash this. And they lined up. And the believers grew. And they grew. And they grew just as prophesied by the Messiah. The Holy Spirit went out and it's going to continue to grow and grow and grow. So then around 313, in the time of Constantine, they believed that 5% of the Roman Empire, so they believed that there were 60 million people in the Roman Empire at that time, there was over 3 million believers in Const in, during Constantine's time. Constantine was faced with a predicament. What do I do with this? What do we do with all these believers? There's enough there to like totally mess up this kingdom, this whole power of what's going on here. So he amalgamated. He amalgamated Christianity with paganism, with the world. That's why we got all these weird things like Easter and stuff like that, right? That's why the Jews were pushed aside. Okay? But we still, we have Yeshua's promises. We have the power of the Holy Spirit that says this is going to continue on throughout the whole world. I don't care what the world says. I don't care who's in charge and what you're going to bring into my congregations and bring into this and try to mess it all up. We know who that's coming from. Okay, this is going to continue to grow throughout the whole world, and it has. It has grown. Okay, you can't stop it. It can't stop it. There are over 3 billion people that believe in the Messiah in the world today. There are, what? They believe there's over millions of churches that are out there. There's millions of churches. And things are changing. Things are changing on the way people are looking at Scripture today. They're saying, wait a minute. What is Passover? What do you mean it's not celebrated as Easter? What, 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 what do you mean it's about the Jewish people? What is the state of Israel? How did it all of a sudden come from nowhere, and why is it there? What do you mean the church hasn't replaced the Jewish people? What, what's going on with that? There's voices that are going out there, a lot of evangelicals, a lot of messianic congregations that are preaching this out on the streets. They're telling the people, hey, look at the scriptures, man. Look at the Jewish people. They're still here. It's all planned by Yeshua. It's all planned by God from the beginning of time that there's a plan for them and that it's going to come full circle. They're going to come back to the land and they're never going to be removed again. Amen. What do you mean? What do you mean? What do you mean that's going to happen? You know, we had 2,000 years of this church stuff going on. And What's that? What oh, is it? Sorry. Look at these scriptures that are all pointing to the Jewish people being back in the land. How does that happen? By the power of the Holy Spirit that is like saying, okay, we got a lot of growth here now. We got a lot of momentum. I get that you tried to persecute us. That didn't work. I get you tried to amalgamate the church with the paganism. That ain't going to work either because I'm going to use it for my good. Right? 
It's not by your power. It's not by your might. It's by the Spirit of the Lord. What it says, that's what's going to happen. We could put all this might into it, but if it ain't by the Spirit, you're not going to get any fruit from it. And so we can see the fruit of what the Holy Spirit, the Ruach, is doing in the world today because it is prophesied by the Lord a long time ago, saying that it's going to go out into the entire world. I want to talk to you about a concept, the Hebrew word abodah. Because our life as believers in the Messiah, when we receive the Holy Spirit, okay, you can't contain it. You can't contain the Holy Spirit. You can't put it in a little box and say, I'm only going to come here on Shabbat, and then that's it. You get the check marks and you go meet Yeshua and say, here, look, man, I went to the synagogue, right? It didn't work for James, right? Not until he got the Holy Spirit, and then look at his life. Look at his life post-Holy Spirit, okay? When you receive the Holy Spirit, he's going to work on you. He's going to make you grow. It's not instantaneous. Boom, you're per perfect in every way in the world. Yeah, your sins are forgiven. You're covered by the blood. But there's more for you to do. You can't, you can't suppress the Holy Spirit. It's going to grow. It's going to grow in the world. It's going to grow in you. It's going to grow in you. So he gives us a standard. When the Holy Spirit dwells in you, he sets up a standard that we need to keep our eyes on. And if we turn to the book of Acts, he gives us some information. I'm sorry, the book of Ephesians. Catherine's back there probably going, what are you doing? You go to the book of Ephesians, it says, let no corrupt word proceed out of your mouth, but what is good and necessary for edification, that it may impart grace to ears. Whoa, that's contrary to the world, right? Flip on the TV and what do you hear? Everything that's wrong with somebody. This guy's doing this, it's going to do it. Come to my school, five minutes, that's all they do on their phone. This person said this, oh, this person said that, oh, this person said that. Next thing you know, I got 10 security guards running out because they're going to go out of their class and get in a fight. Right? That's not edifying. That's not of the Holy Spirit. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed the day of redemption. We receive the Holy Spirit. He wants to use you mightily. He wants to use you for his glory to promote his kingdom so that Holy Spirit, picture it like, they call it torrents of living water. When you receive the Holy Spirit, there's a torrent, a big massive flood of holy water that wants to come out of you and go out through the whole world so that his kingdom can be glorified. That's his plan for you. And you just need to take that step and get over yourself and start moving a little bit forward, you know. You just got to make a little more and another step and another step. And the next thing you know, your life is being transformed and it's going out and other lives are being transformed as well. In whatever capacity the Lord has called you to do. Not everybody out there is going to be called to be a preacher. Not everybody out there is going to be called to do this and that. But whatever task he gives you, whatever it may be, prayer team, street evangelism through the street fair, Right? Worship. Do it with the best of your heart. Do it with the best of your heart. And next thing you know, the Holy Spirit says, Oh, now, now I want you to do this. And now I want you to do this. And then now I want you to do this. That, that's the calling of the Holy Spirit. That's working in your life. You can't suppress it. You can't suppress it. Because then you're just contentious with the Holy Spirit and you're just going to be a hot mess, right? You're going to be a hot mess. You've got to let the Holy Spirit start taking over some of these things and moving out of your comfort zone and doing whatever he says. It's not a burden. Yeah, it's going to be kind of a pain. But yeah, once you get used to it, it just becomes normal. It just becomes normal. You see people that are like cured of alcoholism and cured of this and cured of that. You just don't want to do it anymore. 
I laugh at the kids at school because, you know, the big thing now is vape, right? Everybody wants to vape and, you know, smoking in the boys' room, right? We had that song. So the kids are out there, they're vaping, and I caught this young little girl, she's probably 16 or something like that, and uh, she was like, and then she sees me and she's, <coughs> and I go, you all right, sweetie? She goes, yeah, it was my inhaler. I go, yeah, you were inhaling all right. And so I says, you know what? I go, uh, I go how old do you think I am? And she said, you're really old. And I go, okay. <laughs> That's not where I was going. I go, when I was your age, when I was your age in high school, we had a smoking section on campus. So the students were here on this side, and then over this four foot fence, the teachers were on the other side. And so it's like, hey man, you got a match? Yeah, okay, teacher here. And they'd smoke their cigarettes. And we would actually chew tobacco in class. Sorry, mom, I know you're watching. We would chew tobacco in class. And so I'm like, look, kids, it may be fun now, but think about this. There's consequences to doing that, right? You'll be good for five years or 10 years, but then come down to when you're in your 30s and your 40s, it's not gonna be that great. It's not gonna be great at all. There's one of my friends, I mean, he chewed tobacco along with all of us, and then by the time he's in his 30s, I mean, they were chasing the cancer all throughout his system and just cutting it out. But as a believer in Messiah, that's kind of like sin. It's like, you know, I was doing this before, and the Holy Spirit gets inside of you, and he's just like, I just don't want to do that anymore. And I want to go this way. I want to be with the Lord. I want to have this rest and this peace and the comfort with the Lord. And that's our goal in our life is to continue to seek that, to continue to look towards the Lord to see what he has planned, planned for us and which direction that he wants us to go. And we just we don't need that anymore. And then we move a little farther and the Lord says, okay, I need you to get rid of this and I need you to do this for me. And we, and we go a little bit farther and we go a little bit farther. And we can see that in the lives of everybody here when we spend time with them and we get to know them. And we can see that in our Rabbi Paul. I mean, he, he got on a bus and someone gave him some stuff about prophecies. He didn't want to hear that. And so he starts the modern day messianic movement. I mean, there's thousands of messianic congregations. So look in the span of Paul's life and, and well, I mean, he didn't start when he was a baby. I mean, he became a believer as a young man. So in the last 50 years, from having the first modern-day Messianic congregation to thousands of congregations all spread out through the world, because why? Because he heard the word, and he received the Holy Spirit, and he was obedient to his calling. And it has a compounding effect. Everything you guys do has a compounding effect. Our worship team... We've extended it to nine songs because we have thousands of people that watch us all over the world. It's crazy. And so we start on time and we play extra songs and stuff like that. And it's glorifying the Lord all over the world. It's exposing messianic movement. It's about the Lord. There's dancing? What do you mean, man? That's so Pentecostal. You can't be dancing like that. That's crazy. Oh, wow, they're dancing. They're having a good time. Wow, that's glorifying the Lord. That's putting the seed that's out there to the world. So I encourage those people that are out there on the internet, right? The Holy Spirit is talking to you. Wherever you're at is to go forward. Go forward with how the Holy Spirit is guiding you. You know, have a Bible study. Have Oneg Shabbat. Have some food. Have some fellowship. And the Lord is going to grow, and he's going to grow, and he's going to grow. Well, what about these pagans that are out there? What about all these weird cultures? I'm going to go ahead and close with this. We have to remember all the way back from Genesis that he made us in his likeness. Everybody are made in his likeness. So I believe that every single person out there, even though how much you can't stand them, how much they irritate you, somewhere in their heart is eternity. Somewhere in their life is the Holy Spirit just waiting to get in to that person's life and to change them. Look at Rabbi Shul. He was 
persecuting Christians big time, persecuting the Messianic believers, dragging them out. And then boom, Holy Spirit hits them. The rest is history. Same thing with those pagans. Same things with those people that we can't stand, that irritate us, we have to edify. And we have to be those beacons of light that is the Messiah. That's hard. We drove to Disneyland the other week, and I was about ready to have some road rage because it's very irritating, right? So I need the power of the Holy Spirit to get by with these things when things are trying to drag us the other way. And so if we turn to Psalm 51, 10 through 12, think about this, and then let's put it part of our lives as believers in the Messiah. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Do not cast me away from your presence, and do not take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation, and uphold me your generous spirit. There we go. Looking towards Adonai, looking towards the spirit of the Lord to restore us, to reinvigorate us, to keep us going down this path that he's, that he's called us to do. Amen? Amen. Amen. Let's close in a word of prayer. Father, we just thank you for this time together as Messianic believers, Lord. But thank you for all you do for us. Thank you for Shavuot, your Holy Spirit, coming there and to change our lives. Little by little, Lord, we know that you're with us. Let us not deviate from your presence. Let us focus on you. Let us be obedient to your calling so that we can be a glory, a beacon of light. In Yeshua's mighty name, amen. Amen. Jerry Cohn. Alright, here we go. Ain't Kelo Hainu, Ain't Kadonainu, Ain't Kim Alkainu, Ain't Kamoshi Ainu, Me Kelo Hainu, Me Kadonainu, Me Kim Alkainu, Me Kamoshi Ainu, No Del Elo Hainu, No Del Adonainu, No Del Malkainu, No Del Amoshi Ainu, Baruch Eloheinu, Baruch Adonainu, Baruch Malkainu, Baruch Amoshienu. Atahu Eloheinu, Atahu Adonainu, Atahu Malkainu, Atahu Moshienu. There's none like our God, there's none like our Lord, there's none like, there's none like our King, there's none like our Savior. Who is like our God? Who is like our Lord? Who is like our King? Who is like our Savior? Let us thank our God. Let us thank our Lord. Let us thank our King. Let us thank our Savior. Blessed is our God. Blessed is our Lord. Blessed is our King. Blessed is our Savior. It is you who is our God. It is you who is our Lord. It is you who is our King. It is you who is our Savior. Shabbat Shalom, everyone.